Thank you all for coming. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's Coleridge Lecture by Andrew Kelly. My name is Rich Pankost. I'm director of the Cabot Institute, and, and we've been partnering with Festival of Ideas on these programs, and we are particularly excited for this evening's event and, and to hear Andrew speak himself, um, not only who, behind the inspiration for these lectures, but also about his own interests and his own particular perspectives. Um, the Coleridge series is, th this is the first year, but it's going to be an annual program. This year the program is focused around the Romantic Poets. You have, have brochures outside, and of course there's lots of information on the web. You can learn about the upcoming uh, Romantic Poets lectures, but you can also learn about the, all of the other Festival of Ideas lectures. Importantly, Amy, who's took some of your tickets, produced this lovely self-guided walking tour to so understand how the Romantic Poets interfaced with the city of Bristol and, and perhaps gives you a little bit of idea of the inspiration for this series. Um, I should say as well that although this is a, a joint venture between the Festival of Ideas predominantly and the Cabot Institute and also Bristol uh, um, 2015 company, um, we need to acknowledge a lot of other people who have supported us, including Business West, UWE, and, um, and certainly the Arts Council England, which, which has funded this program. Now, of course, to Andrew, which is why we're all here, and, and thanks very much for giving this lecture this evening, Andrew. Um, I've got his, I got his team to give me all sorts of notes and interesting things to say. There's nothing embarrassing here, it's all good. I, I was a little disappointed that they didn't dig up any dirt on you, Andrew. It's all very professional, and of course, it's also very, very deeply impressive. Obviously, we know Andrew is director of the um, of Festival of Ideas and the Bristol Cultural Development Partnership. He's also a visiting professor at the University of the West of England. His projects in the past, he's had a very long history in this city, engaging in all sorts of ways. They've included the strategic planning of culture across the city, leading to Bristol's bid for the um, European Capital of Culture in 2008, Brunel 200, and the annual Bristol Great Reading Adventure. He led the cultural regeneration of Harborside Bristol in the 1990s. It was directors of, uh, I didn't realize this, you were director of the Brief Encounters Film Festival for five years. Um, worked on the development, management, and implementation of the Bristol Legible City Project. We know him probably best, or, or perhaps maybe I'm speaking for myself. I know him best because of his role as director of the Festival of Ideas. And established in 2004, it was a progenitor to effectively um, be a foundation for the bid for um, City of Culture. It's been running for more than 10 years. Just all quietly in, in your think, how many Festival of Ideas events have happened in the past 10 years? Just, any, any guesses? Just shout out a guess. 20,000. <laughs> well played. It complete, that completely undermines the drama of the number I'm going to throw out. Now, it, it, you, within a factor of, of 10, it's spot on. It's, it's about 2,000 events, which a little bit of calculation still works out to be 200 per year, which means that most days in this city there's been an event put on by the Festival of Ideas, and that's astonishing. Um, just a few highlights. Most recently, in 2014, he directed Bristol 2014, the largest UK program commemorating the centenary of the First World War. And he, of course, he's making major contributions via the Festival of Ideas to um, the Bristol 2015 European Green Capital Year. That includes this program. It also includes six major arts projects, four summits. The culmination of the year will be the Festival of the Future City in November of 2015. I don't actually know how you guys do it. You spend all day organizing these events and you spend all evening running them. And tonight is a good example because, of course, Andrew is here doing the event tonight and then afterwards running down to at Bristol Watershed to do yet another event. I mean, there's this deep commitment to the culture of the city. It's deep commitment to the city. We're very, very proud of that and we're very happy to have Andrew here today. And all of that would be great justification for to actually hear his own thoughts. But on top of running all of that, he's actually extremely, well, I've, I've sat in a lot of dinners with him and Andrew is one of the most brilliant people I know a polymath interested in a huge range of subjects, and, and to me he's an inspiration because he created this, I believe, because it is his passion, and it's a great example to all of us that you can pursue your passion as a lifestyle, and also, you know, you can make a living doing what you really, really love. He's written 12 books, and we are honored to have him talk about what you're, what, well, basically to speak about the animals in the fraternity of nature this evening. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Rich. I, and can I thank you very much for your support for this series and all the work that you do with us, as does the University of Bristol. It's 
an inspiration to us as well as a partner in terms of all the work we do. What I want tonight to do is talk about the romantic poets and animal rights. And I also want to talk about contemporary campaigns and how these connect. Rich mentioned a little bit about the series. It's worth saying that we've always wanted in the Cultural Development Partnership to run a programme on the romantics and especially to stake our claim that Bristol, through their time in the city and through the publication of the lyrical ballads and more, is the birthplace of romanticism. Over the past 20 years, we've spent time looking at many hidden aspects of Bristol's past. Brunel 200 is a good example of that. And we published in 2008 a cartoon history of Bristol in, in 200 pages, which had a circulation of 85,000 copies. We were very keen to do this because we wanted to overcome the oft-repeated statement that Bristol is the city where good ideas come to die. And we wanted to make sure that we could celebrate what this city is good at. And the Romantics gave us a great opportunity to do that. There's no particular anniversary this year. We chose to do it because it's Bristol 2015, and we could look at nature and place and contemporary environmental concerns. We commissioned 23 new poems and new lyrical ballads. Rich has talked about the walks that you can do and the new lectures uh, that we commissioned, inspired by the lectures Coleridge himself gave in 1795 in the city. And we want these lectures to explore a theme widely and to pose challenges to our thinking today. Next year, the theme is utopia. Our theme this year is radical environmentalism. If you've attended any of these lectures, and you can see them all filmed and hear recordings, if you haven't, we've looked already at conservatism and conservation. What a green government could do if it really wanted to do something. And green and social justice. How much should we include issues of inequality and... Uh, and work, working patterns into green debates and policies. And tonight we're looking at animal rights. In preparing for this series, I read a lot about the Romantic poets. I read some of their work for the first time and reread work that I hadn't looked at for probably 30 years, since school days, in fact. And as I read it, it struck me how some of the concerns of the poets then are ones that still concern us, or perhaps should concern us, now. And most of all, I was struck by how they and others associated with them had something to say about a cause which I've campaigned for over 25 years, which is the rights of animals. Though mocked at the time for these views, the Romantic played a key part in helping to create the grounds for important legislation on the protection of animals in the 19th century. They also created, very importantly, a culture for debate about these issues. But they and the legislation that followed did not create a settled view. Arguments about the rights of animals have flared ever since. Indeed, many of the things that concern the Romantics remain controversial today, and it could be argued that the position is much, much worse. The cruelty facing animals slaughtered for food, hunting with dogs, badger baiting, the badger cull, and, um, and the decimation of birds for sport and more. On top of all this is something which would have saddened them greatly, the decimation of na the natural world worldwide. So for this lecture, I decided to look at what they said and what that led to and where we are now with some of these issues. But as these are the Coleridge lectures and should have a challenge thrown down, I'm throwing down a challenge to Bristol 2015 and me and all of us at the end. I would hope that one of the things we can see resulting from the work in Bristol 2015 is a better approach to nature in urban areas, for example. I should add and I noticed that my chairman is in the room, that I'm speaking in a personal capacity. That's perhaps very wise. Around the end of the 18th century, something began to change in the views about the relationship of humans to the natural world. That historian of popular political and humanitarian movements, E.S. Turner, said in his book, All Heaven in a Rage, about this movement, that the contribution made by the Romantic poets cannot be measured in precise terms, but their influence on the collective mind of the nation down the generations may have been more potent than anyone supposes. And it was not just poets. E.S. Turner again. Humanitarianism was not a movement but a state of mind which animated small pockets of the literate world. Its propagandists had no common social, religious, or intellectual background. They included essayists, philanthropists, novelists of sensibility, clergymen, utilitarian philosophers, the infrequent sportsmen, the eccentric and crank, and the pious, conscience-torn citizen who could not believe that God had condemned his innocent creatures to misuse and oblivion. 
Wider political, religious, and philosophical debate went alongside this and influenced and inspired the Romantics. In 1789, Jeremy Bentham, in his introduction to the principles of morals and legislation, said, and it's little wonder that he's known as perhaps the first patron saint of animal rights, that other animals, which on account of their interests having been neglected by the insensibility of the ancient jurists, stand degraded into the class of things. The day has been, I grieve it to say, in many places it is not yet past, in which the greater part of the species, under the denomination of slaves, have been treated upon the same footings as animals are still. The day may come when the rest of the animal creation may acquire those rights which never could have been withholden from them but by the hand of tyranny. The French have already discovered that the blackness of skin is no reason why a human being should be abandoned without redress to the caprice of a tormentor. It may come one day to be recognised that the number of legs, the velocity of the skin, or the termination of the os sacrum are reasons equally insufficient for abandoning a sensitive being to the same fate. What else is it that should trace the insuperable line? Is it the faculty of reason, or perhaps the faculty for discourse? The question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? Why should the law refuse its protection to any sensitive being? The time will come when humanity will extend, extend its mantle over everything with, which breathes. Five years later, Tom Paine in The Age of Reason, uh, and one of the things I discovered in this work it was a wonderful poem he wrote called Cruelty to Animals Exposed, but in The Age of, Region, he said, Age of Reason he said, the moral duty of man consists in imitating the moral goodness and beneficence of God manifested in the creation towards all his creatures. That seeing as we daily do the goodness of God to all men, it is an example calling upon all men to practice the same towards each other, and consequently that everything of persecution and revenge between man and man and everything of cruelty to animals is a violation of moral duty. The Romantics were not the only voices, but what did they do and what did they think that makes their work special? They started a movement. They concerned themselves with wider political debate and issues such as the slave trade. They took great interest in science, the natural world and animals, but went further in their wider vision. In his ill-fated utopian community, the Pantisocracy, the all-governing society where labour would be minimised and time devoted to study, discussion and educating children, Coleridge said animals were to be brothers and sisters in the fraternity of universal nature. This laid the foundation for much of the thinking of him and his fellow romantics. So why was this concern for animals at this time? Some saw it as a natural extension of the growing spirit of philanthropy that had also created homes and hospitals. Some, and this is a view held very strongly, as an extension of the rights of animals to the rights of men and women coming out of the French Revolution. Some adopted a Hogarthian view that cruelty to animals corrupted those that indulged in it. And others, there was a religious basis. They found it hard to accept that even though God had given humans dominion over animals, they should be treated so badly. There was, of course, inconsistencies. Some poets hated hunting but fished. And as David Perkins points out in his book on romanticism and animal rights, they all wrote their poems about cruelty with quills from live geese. But there was a shift, and at the heart of this was kindness. Some would say a sentimentality, motivated by the cruelty they saw widely. And it was widespread in pamphlets and sermons and children's books and poems that argued for the innocence of animals, argued that they expressed fidelity and courage, and that most of all they deserved the right to life, justice and happiness. And at the heart of this movement were the two figures we have focused on in this series, Coleridge and Wordsworth. And I want to go through a little bit of their work and also what some others wrote uh, to explore some of these points about animals, small and large, about hunting, animals as pets, among many other issues. For Coleridge, the pantisocracy meant living harmoniously with the natural world, where land was a common heritage to all and where all life was sacred, a national trust, uh, as Richard Holmes says. His early poem, addressed to a young jackass, was inspired by one he saw tied to a post at Jesus Green. For Coleridge, this was a poor little foal of an oppressed race, an enslaved creature, and had concerns not just for the animal, but it was also a reflection of his political and religious beliefs and his concerns about working class life, a metaphor for the people, poor people of England at the end of the 18th century. There was a place for the foal in his utopia. Innocent foal, though poor, despised, forlorn, I hail thee, brother, spite of the fool's scorn. 
and fain I take thee with me in the dell of high-souled pantisocracy to dwell. Coleridge was lampooned by Lord Byron and no doubt made fun of by many. Byron himself opposed bullfighting, so he shared similar sentiments. But Coleridge's sensibility, philosophy and belief went through other aspects of his work, most notably the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Richard Holmes covered this in detail last week, and you can see the film of this soon and can hear the lecture online now, so I don't want to go into detail. But in essence, the rhyme of the ancient mariner, which is perhaps the most famous poem about a bird, is about the punishment someone faces for destroying the bird and the redemption they partly achieve. Some have seen the punishment endured as disproportionate to the crime. Literary analysts can argue over that and other aspects. What's important to us here is Coleridge's conclusion, which showed how committed he was to the fraternity of universal nature. He said, near the end, the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all. He prayeth best who loveth best, all things both great and small. For the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all. He prayeth well who loveth well, both man and bird and beast. But it wasn't just birds or indeed fowl, foals. One of the most remarkable things about the Romantics and other writers at the time was the attention paid to smaller animals and insects. We tend to focus, or at least campaign groups do, on the larger animals now. But it was refreshing that the Romantics covered this. And so we should too, today after all, they're essential for the life we live. The ones they focused on were often the despised and tortured creatures. Worms, millipedes and snails, ladybirds, Catherine Ann Dorset's O oh, ladybird, ladybird, why dost thou roam so far from thy comrade, so distant from home? Blake looked at slugs, earwigs, tapeworms, and fleas. His songs of innocent had, am not I a fly like thee, or art not thou a man like me? Robert Southey, compatriot of Wordsworth and Coleridge, wrote a poem about a spider. Spider, thou needst not run in fear about to shun my curious eyes. I won't humanely crush thy bowels out. Particularly graphic, this one lest thou shouldst eat the flies, nor will I roast thee with a damned delight, thy strange instinctive fortitude to see, for there is one who might one day roast me. Robert Burns used a louse in his most famous poem. Richard Holmes last week, uh, two weeks ago talked about uh, the, tie, the, the, the Coleridge's refusal to kill the mice in his cottage. Um, they mice play the very devil with us. It irks me to set a trap, he wrote by all the whiskers of all the pussies that have mewed plaintive your amorously since the days of Whittington, it is not fair. Um, no, I cannot set a trap, he wrote to Joseph Cottle. Robert Burns liked mice too. In To a Mouse, he saw animals, in his poem To a Mouse, he saw animals as fellow mortals and showed a fellowship with all living things, not just humans. I'm truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union and justifies that ill opinion which makes thee startle at me thy poor earthborn companion and fellow mortal. For Wordsworth, animals lack the faculty of reason, but shared with humans the principle of love and pleasure, according to David Perkins. In his poem, Lines Written in Early Spring, at the same time as bemoaning what man has made of man, he praised the birds. He wrote, the birds around me hopped and played, their thoughts I cannot measure, but the least motion which they made, it seemed a thrill of pleasure. The budding twigs spread out their fan to catch the breezy air, and I must think, do all I can, that there was pleasure there. Like many of the Romantics, words were opposed hunting. For many at the time, hunting was seen as a way of becoming a man, to harden soldiers for a war, indeed a symbol of courage. Some poets surprisingly liked hunting or wrote about it favourably. John Clare was one in Today the Fox Must Die, for example. Robert Burns wrote My Heart's in the Highlands, a chasing the deer, but he also attacked hunting in letters and other work. Byron, Sherry and Wordsworth were opposed. In his poem, Heart Leap Well, in the 1800 edition of the Lyrical Ballads, not published in Bristol this time, Wordsworth attacked hunting. His hunted stag was chased for so long, he said for 13 hours he ran a desperate race before he dies, that only one hunter is left at the end, and the dogs have either stopped or died of exhaustion. There's no doubt where Wordsworth's sympathies lies. He asks about the suffering the animal faced. What thoughts must through the creature's brain have passed, he said, and refers to God again and care for all creatures. He wrote, The being that is in the clouds and air, that is in the green laves among the groves, maintains a deep and reverential care for them the quiet creatures whom he loves. 
Another reason for the growth of animal rights sentiment at this time was the increasing use of companion animals and the bond that existed between human and animal. Keith Thomas, in his Man in the Natural World, said that keeping pets encouraged the middle class classes to form optimistic conclusions about animal intelligence. It gave rise to innumerable anecdotes about animal sagacity. It stimulated the notion that animals could have character and individual personality. And it created the psychological foundation for the view that some animals at least were entitled to moral consideration. Wordsworth wrote a poem called Fidelity, which celebrated a dog that had stayed three months next to his dead master. A shepherd at one point comes across the barking dog. Wordsworth wrote, the shepherd stood, then makes his way towards the dog, o oh, rocks and stones, as quickly as he may. Not far had gone, nor far had gone before he found a human skeleton on the ground. Sad sight, the shepherd with a sigh looks round to learn the history. From those abrupt and perilous rocks, the man had fallen, that place of fear. At length upon the shepherd's mind, it breaks and all is clear. He instantly recalled the name and who he was and whence he came. Remembered too the very day on which the traveller passed his way. But here a wonder now, for sake of which this mournful tale I tell, a lasting monument of words, this wonder merits well. The dog which still was hovering nigh, repeating the same timid cry, this dog had been through three months' space, a dweller in that savage place. Yes, proof was plain that since the day on which the traveller thus had died, the dog had watched about the spot or by his master's side. How nourished here through such long time, he knows who gave that love sublime and gave that strength of feeling great above all human estimate. The hunted hare was another who aroused sympathy. I've always been haunted by the account that Thomas Buick gave about a hare he caught when he was 12 around the year 1775. Buick was the great uh, wood engraver, sort of engraver. The story is in Jenny Uglow's marvellous biography of Buick and, and elsewhere. For Buick before then, the pursuing, baiting, or killing of animals never struck me as being cruel, he said. His mind had not yet been impressed with the feelings of humanity. This changed when he caught a hare, he says. He caught a hare in my arms while surrounded by the dogs and the hunters when the poor terrified creature screamed out so piteously like a child that I would have given anything to save its life. In this, however, I was prevented. For a farmer well known to me who stood close by pressed upon me and desired I would give her to him. And from his being better able, as I thought, to save its life, I complied with his wishes. This was no sooner done than he proposed to those about him to have, he said, a bit more sport with her. And this was done by first breaking one of its legs and then setting again, setting the poor animal off a little before the dogs. William Cowper, the popular 18th century poet, kept hares as pets, which saved them from being hunted. He wrote a poem called Detested Sport. He called out hunting that owes its pleasures to another pain, another's pain that feeds upon the sobs and dying shrieks of harmless nature, dumb but yet endured with eloquence, that agonies inspire of tears and heart descending sighs. Cowper also embraced other animals in his works and beliefs. In his poem, The Task, he did not keep friends with people who needlessly sets foot upon a worm. He hated the slaughterhouse too. He found God in all animals and felt that God would punish those who did them harm. Again in the task, his poem, he told the story of the ox heading for slaughter, goaded as he runs to madness while the savage at his heels laughs at the frantic sufferer's fury. Other country sports were attacked. Shelley, who in Prometheus and Bound said, I wish no living thing to suffer pain, hated shooting and the game laws for protecting what he said was a barbarous and bloody sport and allowing people to kill and torture living beings. Shelley was a vegetarian, unsurprisingly, one of the few from that period. Ball baiting and cockfighting were attacked. John Stuart Mill equated anim working animals with slaves. And cage birds came in for particular condemnation. As Blake wrote, a robin red best in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. A dove house filled with doves and pigeons shudders hell through all its regions. And he went on to other animals. A dog starve at his master's gate predicts the ruin of the state. A horse misused upon the road calls to heaven for human blood. Each outcry of the hunted hare a fibre from the brain does tear and more and more follows. 
And finally, badger baiting was attacked, especially by that great poet John Clare. He wrote dispassionately, but ultimately movingly, in his sonnets about the badger. And he tells about the badger caught by a host of dogs and men, trapped in a sack, put down his set, held down with a forked stick, and baited all day with dogs. He then tries to escape. He tries to reach the woods an awkward race, but sticks and cudgels quickly stop the chase. He turns again and drives the noisy crowd and beats the many dogs in noises loud. He drives away and beats them every one, and then they loose him and set them on. He falls as dead and kicked by boys and men, then starts and grins and drives the crowd again, till kicked and torn and beaten out he lies and leaves his hold, hold and cackles and groans and dies. So what impact did all this have politically? Over time, the debate has had an impact on pet keeping, hunting, bear and bull baiting, butchery, vivisection, the caging of wild birds. There were persistent attempts coming out of the Romantics work in Parliament from 1800 onwards to change the law. Bills to prevent animal cruelty were presented in 1800 and 1809, but defeated. It wasn't until 1822, with the Cruel Treatment of Cattle Act, with the effect of the first parliamentary legislation to deal with this cruelty. And that was interesting, led by Richard Martin and William Wilberforce. Two years later, the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals was founded, which became the RSPCA 16 years later. In 1835, badger baiting, cock fighting, and bull baiting became a misdemeanor. In, 1987, um, in 1876, a new Cruelty to Animals Act controlled vivisection and animal experiments. And we go on, badger protection being achieved in 1992, fur farming abolished in 2000, hunting with dogs finally banned in 2003 in Scotland and in 2005 in England after many attempts and private members' bills, but eventually cross-party support, but not uh, universal support. It's interesting that if you read the recent article on The Economist, which quoted Tony, Bear, Tony Blair, the one act he still regrets above everything else is the Fox Hunting Act, believe it or not. Hunting will be, continue to be a battle fought in Parliament, as we can see, uh, and if you read the Daily Telegraph or any of the other papers uh, at the moment. So there's much more legislation in place, and animals are protected more than in the days of the Romantics. The Romantics helped lay the ground for a better way of thinking about animals and showed why it was essential that protection was necessary. It's a proud legacy in many ways, and now we have much more stronger campaigns. Research is as it most advanced, uh, lobby groups fight hard for change, but it's clearly not enough. If it is true that we're living in a new era of human development, the Anthropocene, when our activities are having a, such a significant global impact on the Earth's ecosystems, and that this is leading to a loss of bio, biodiversity and much else on a scale not encountered before, it's clear that we no longer have time. This is the big issue facing us if we're trying to save species, animals, and much wider. There's much to despair about the state of animals in this world. Depressing news arrives every day. Today I read the most, report, most recent report on canned hunting in Africa, where animals, lions, are simply bred to be shot by wealthy, generally Western, hunters for between $5,000 and $80,000. Some lions even have genetic variants added, so they are white and have blue eyes. All this for a head on a wall. And these aren't even wild lions. But apart from the cruelty involved in the shooting, there are fears that trade like this hides the illegal trade in lions, and cant hunting has certainly done nothing to stop poaching. In 1980, there were 75,000 wild lions in Africa. There are now 25,000 on only 23% of the original land that they had. It was good to read today that 585,000 people, people in this room, may have also participated in the RSPB Big Garden Bird Watch. But you also learn that sparrow numbers are down 58% from when the fir survey first started in 1979, and starlings are staggering 80%. And I often think about the starlings that used to visit my garden in such numbers, but are rarely seen now. Elephants are in severe decline. Tens of thousands have been poached in Africa in recent years. Rhinos were once abundant throughout Africa and Asia, with an approximate worldwide population of 500,000. The Western black rhino is now extinct, uh, primary cause being poaching, and all five remaining rhino species are listed on the uh, red list of, in, of threatened species, with three of them classified as critically endangered. The State of Nature report looked at, uh, in 2013, looked at 3,148 UK species, 
Of these, 60% have declined over the last 50 years, and 31% have declined strongly. And there's more. There's a huge growth in meat eating, especially in places like China. Um, and we have our own horrors here with the potential growth of mega dairies, which keep, bees, uh, sorry, which keep cows inside all year. The number of bee species facing extinction, around 10% in Europe, shows the impact of intensive agriculture. And the amount of whaling that still goes on for bogus research purposes. And the news this week that in the 20th century, humans killed, this is based on very detailed research, killed 2,894,094 whales, shows the destruction of some of the greatest creatures of all. I could go on, hedgehogs in severe decline, raptor persecution in shooting estates, um, the birds shot in their annual migrant uh, trips uh, across the Maltese islands on their way back from Africa. At least 24 species of protected birds were killed in 2013. And unbelievably, on a military base in Cyprus, which we all own, um, an estimated 900,000 birds were killed, shot last year in illegal hunting. So the Romantics may have left a legacy, and a proud legacy, but they may also have felt that some of their time was wasted. We do need things to make us feel better. I think it's very interesting that there's been a huge backlash against SeaWorld following the Blackfish documentary, which has seen many question why we keep such animals not just in captivity, but make them entertain us. Ring Ring Brothers' decision to end elephant acts in the United States, though not immediately, and retire them to a sanctuary is not only long overdue, but also illustrates our own government's failure to ban wild animals in circuses, even though almost everybody wanted this to happen. And the moves to provide legal status for great apes currently wending its way slowly through the US courts might see compassion and rights extended legally as well as morally. And if you do want cheering up in this rather desperate story, do watch the films that Animal Asia releases of the bears they release from the bear bile farms in Vietnam and elsewhere in Asia. You see these, but the ordeal these bears have gone through is quite incredible. Imprisoned in tiny cages, milked for bile for dubious medical reasons, but once released, they savour the air and the space, make friends with other bears, possibly the first time, and have a light, a life at last. And I think we can also see hope in the increased interest in what's called the new nature writing, although it's fair to say that none of the new nature writers actually like that term. They're all worth reading, and we've been fortunate to have many of these writers speak in Bristol. Richard Maybe, for example, uh, writing books from food to free to nature cure, shows how nature helped deal with his depression. Um, Kathleen Jamie, who spoke here recently, she's written work which resembles most that closely to the romantics. And Helen MacDonald, an H is for Hawk, uh, illustrated as some of the romantics did, the bond between human and bird. So what is the challenge? Though legislation needs strengthening, and I'll cover that in a moment, there's something bigger that's needed. We live in a great age of knowledge, but the more we learn about animals, the faster we're losing them. We know so much more, but seem only to be able to do a little. Animals are going extinct more quickly than we can learn about them. In some cases, even pronounce their name, or in some cases, even name them. We seem not to have the imagination to make the changes needed and help reverse this tragedy. And in truth, we're only holding back disaster unless more radical change is made. George Monbiot, in his important book about rewilding, talks about shifting baseline syndrome. He says, the people of every generation perceive the state of the ecosystems they encountered in their childhood as normal. When fish or other animals or plants are depleted, ca campaigners and scientists might call for them to be restored to the numbers that existed in their youth, their own ecological baseline. But they often appear to be unaware that they were considered normal when they were children, was in fact a state of extreme depletion, and I think each of us uh, can recognise that. So we're in Bristol 2015, a European green capital should do something about the state of nature. Our work in Bristol 2015 includes managing arts projects and big ideas events, such as summits, conferences and debates. We've taken the view that these should be challenging, and we want people involved and the city as a whole to challenge us back. And there are six areas where I think challenge is appropriate in relation to this work, from the smallest steps to perhaps larger legislative campaigns. There are many more, but this is a start. The first is what Monbio talked about in rewilding. We should support this. Recently, wild beavers were allowed to stay in Devon following tests. 
the first time we've had them living wild since they were made extinct several centuries ago, since the before the Romantics were writing their poems, in fact. There are plans to introduce the lynx into Scotland, though typically the National Farmers' Union is sceptical. And when the BBC reported this, their correspondent pointed out that this is good news, that real wilding rightly needs to include the blue stag beetle and others, which have, both, which have been extinct for at least 120 years. In terms of new legislation, we've been heavily involved in the potential new Nature and Wellbeing Act. We've already held one conference and public debate on these proposals, which is being brought together by the Wildlife Trusts, the National Trust and the RSPB. This act would place nature at the heart of how decisions are made about health, housing and other development, education, economic growth, flood, flood resilience and social cohesion. It says that the protection and creation of healthy woods, rivers, meadows, parks and wildland would help achieve objectives in all these areas. It won't be a quick process. The intention is to see the case made now and through the next parliament and get 2015 manifesto commitments where possible and then to make it happen in the parliament from 2020. A smaller step that we could each take is about single-use plastic bottles. It's staggering, really, that we haven't solved this problem, though typical when we still give plastic bags away free at the supermarket. Plastics in the ocean are a major problem. We're going to see that over the summer in the work we're doing in Bristol 2015. It's not the only problem facing the oceans. Overfishing is the main one, and action is needed here too. But we can all address this issue. We're creating an artwork this summer, the Bristol Whales, life-size whale sculptures in Millennium Square. And around them will be a sea made up of single-use plastic bottles, around 100,000 of which come from their use in Bristol's two major road races. Think of that, 100,000 in just two road races. Should Bristol campaign to ban single-use plastic bottles, as San Francisco is trying to do? I'm hoping that this focus on arts projects in Bristol 2015, as with all our work, will lead to greater involvement by artists in challenging us all and helping to create change. Another area is food. We've been fortunate because we have to challenge all the venues that we use on their food origins and how welfare-friendly it is. Most are very good, it's fair to say, and this university has spent a lot of time working on making their food provision uh, as welfare-friendly as they can. But in some venues, provide the barest minimum of animal welfare. Palm oil should be an easy one, or at least I thought. Our insatiable use of palm oil is leading to the destruction of habitats and directly and indirectly killing orangutans. I challenge the Bristol 2015 staff to give up biscuits with palm oil in this year. A small step, but I think a hard one to be achieved. Another area is pollinators, something that Bristol and this university excels in. It's good to see venues like at Bristol supporting pollinators in their building. Just one small example which could be replicated elsewhere. And finally and critically, it's about getting cities right. Cities are havens for some wildlife. We're heading to have the majority of people living and working in cities. There's a big chance for us here um, to create, for example, better homes for animals uh, through the way we build our buildings. Next week in our final lecture in this series, Melissa Harrison will look at cities and nature and we'll talk about some of these things. My fear, though, despite all of this, is we're creating a bleak future for animals. Perhaps what we might face us is best summed up by that scientific romantic H.G. Wells in the culmination of the time machine. His, his lead character goes 30 million years into the future. I looked about me to see if any traces of animal life remind, remained, but I saw nothing moving in earth or sky or sea. The green slime on the rocks alone testified that life was not extinct. A shallow sandbank had appeared in the sea and the water had receded from the beach. I fancied I saw some black object flopping about upon this bank, but it became motionless as I looked at it, and I judged that my eye, eye had been deceived, and the black object was merely a rock. The stars in the sky were intensely bright and seemed to me to twinkle very little. The darkness grew apace, a cold wind began to blow in freshening gusts from the east, and the showering white flakes in the air increased in number. From the edge of a sea came a ripple and whisper, Beyond these lifeless sounds, the world was silent. Silent. It would be hard to convey the stillness of it. All the sounds of man, the bleating of sheep, the cries of birds, the hums of insects, the stir that makes the background of our lives, all that was over. All else was rayless obscurity. The sky was absolutely black. 
the horror of this great darkness came on me. I very much hope that this is not our destiny. So let's return to optimism. In his call for rewilding, George Monbiot calls for a raucous summer and not a silent spring, not the silence that H.G. Wells talked about. Tony Juniper in Bristol recently called us to value nature economically. Having tried other arguments, he feels this may be one way forward to success. And perhaps the romantics can offer us something still. Thomas Hardy made a very interesting point about the implications of Darwin's work for the golden rule, that we should treat others as you'd like to be treated yourself. He said in a letter, few people seem to perceive fully as yet that the most far-reaching consequences of the establishment of the common origin of all species is ethical, that it logically involved a readjustment of altruistic morals by enlarging as a necessity the application of what had been called the golden rule, beyond the area of mere, mere mankind to that of the whole animal kingdom. And that is perhaps the heart of romanticism. And returning once again to that romantic poet who knew most about the natural world, John Clare, in the progress of rhyme he wrote, for everything I felt a love, the weeds below, the birds above, and weeds that bloomed in summer hours, I thought they should be reckoned flowers. They made a garden free for all, and so I loved them, great and small. Perhaps the best thing we can do in this year, and in all we do, is to instill a love for all living things and extend the golden rule to all. That would be a great legacy. And then perhaps we can truly say that animals are truly our brothers and sisters in the fraternity of universal nature. Thank you very much. Um, the cruelties that were being done to animals at the time the romantics were writing seem to be ones that we now abhor um, as, as a norm. Uh, and it seems to me that a lot of the cruelties to animals that are being uh, conducted these days uh, are in factory farms and most forms of industrialised farming, um, which are mostly hidden to us. I think there are massive vested interests in keeping that hidden, in keeping the cognitive dissonance of uh, people who would consume those products, uh, keeping, keeping that at bay. Uh, what role do you think art has in bringing that to the fore? Because I think the visual images and quite hard-nosed reporting on, on those places that are hidden uh, are, are potentially effective, but I, I, I somehow wonder whether the romantics' approach would work for such, such industrialised horrors that they had not imagined. I, know, I think you're right, and I think it's very difficult. There's a wonderful artist called Sue Coe in America who does draw slaughterhouses and so on in a wonderfully moving way, and in a horrible way as well. And I, I'm not really sure what the answer is on that. It's certainly the case that that's where the greatest cruelty goes on, it seems to me. If you think about... If you, you know, the, the recent campaigns by, uh, I think it's Animal Aid, who have gone in undercover and put cameras into slaughterhouses and seen some quite horrific scenes of cruelty, which have led to those slaughterhouses losing their licences almost immediately. And each one they've put in seems to show that. Uh, you can begin to see what goes on. I think that there's a much wider role for art and artists in, 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 in raising the profile of the animals that are slaughtered. You know, it's, it's something which perhaps we should consider commissioning, as we did with our lyrical ballads, a whole series of new poems which perhaps illustrate some of these points. But I think that's what we rely on their imagination for. I think with the Wales project that's going into Millennium Square, um, we do know what happens to whaling and industrialised whaling on quite a, a large scale. And one would hope that that would illustrate that in a very direct way. The, uh, one thing I omitted to mention was the plastic bottles that would be used. We hope people would put a message in there, which we could then use in taking that message to the, the Paris talks in December from the people of Bristol. But I think artists, as ever... We, we're, in fact, we're just about to launch the arts projects in Bristol 2015 uh, on April the 14th, and... Um, um, we've, a few people have written introductions to that and they too talk about the way that artists can challenge but also to help create new conversations and to help change conversations as well and I think that's something we will ask them. I'm not pretending it's an easy thing to do at all but you're right to point that being the major welfare problem of our times and will get worse. Uh, you mentioned when you were talking about William Wilberforce and... Um, I liken the 
um, campaign to create a bill for, of rights for animals, which is going on in America at the moment, very much to the campaign against slavery. And I suppose you could also equate it to the campaign to get women's rights. Right. And at the time, everybody thought it was, you know, well, not everybody, many thought the women were mad. Many thought people were mad to think that black people shouldn't be slaves and that our whole society depended on it um, and women being in the home. You paint quite a negative picture about the future for animals. I, I'm wondering whether there may be a more positive outcome in the next 100 years or 200 years that actually animal rights will be recognised and maybe we can't foresee that at the moment. I, I, I am quite pessimistic, I have to say, but I think that's simply based on the sheer level of destruction that we... You know, the very fact that you know, we, we own a military base in Cyprus and it's illegal to hunt on there and 900,000 birds were shot there in one year, this is, this is quite ridiculous, really. So I think that pessimism is based on that. I think what's interesting about the romantics is exactly what you've said, which is how the rights, particularly then for slave, uh, for freeing slaves, and, and universal rights for humans, it wasn't quite women's rights then, that came much later, obviously, as we know, um, was equated with the, the rights of animals as well. So I think they made those interesting connections. I think that we need to look at those connections again today. I think there is a need for universal um, rights um, for still for many humans as well as for animals, and that's something which I, I'm very keen to see. I think that, you know, we've made enormous strides forward, those of us who campaign on these issues over the past few years. It's been very slow and it's been very frustrating and failure seems ever-present, but, but there has been change and I would hope that within a few years' time, a hundred years' time, things might be different. One of the things that people say is that when we... Tony Benn used to say this, that when you look back at, um, you know, in the future, look back, people will be staggered that we treated not just humans like this, but animals like it as well, and maybe that's the case. Um, I think we can just make small steps forward. We'll never see that glorious sunrise, I'm afraid, but, uh, but we may be able to play a small role in that. Um, in defence of farmers, is that if I find it really interesting when people, forever, in terms of if you're farming, keeping more cows, whatever, you must be bad, is that the reality is that in terms of, I think, many and probably the vast majority of people have been prosecuted for serious animal neglect have not been what are considered probably commercial farmers. There are people who kind of do things by hobby, then they say, can't afford to keep, look after the animals and think, well, it must be the big farmers. And the reality is that if you've got 30 or 40 cows or you've got 200 or 300, the economics of calling the vet in are much easier with two or 300 because you can justify that. And, you know, it, you know that's a case of size matters. Another thing is, I remember last year on the big green week, I was in... Um, in the part that the city owned, took walking with Satish Kumar and had a debate with him regarding robotic milk of cows. And he said, you shouldn't do that because it takes away the interaction between man and, a man and the cow. And I said, Satish, it brings back the reality and the way a cow is, has evolved. A cow has evolved to feed her offspring. And the cow goes to the robot, gets milk by the robot, and is uh, hugely less stressed. I mean, the, the only problem I see with robots currently is that the cows tend to be in a shed because of that. There is no great reason why the robots should not be taken to the fields in the summer. Any observations, please? I think, I mean, I think there's, there's a huge difference between small farms and huge factory farms. I mean, the, the pr recent proposal for the farm in Lincolnshire was 8,000 cows. Was was just bizarre and you know lots of people oppose that from the local council to residents through to welfare organizations i think when you i mean i personally made a decision not to use dairy products so i have a different view of the use of those to to other people i think that when you know the the, the big problem that we've had in recent times has been the exposure of slaughterhouses to um which have created some which have um, some very cruel practices that have been exposed there I think farming is a, is, is a, it's a business I particularly wouldn't want to be in. I think it's particularly the case at the moment where the supermarkets have farmers over a barrel when it comes to milk prices, where it seems that, you know, it's cheaper not to, you know, it's more expensive to produce them than actually the money comes back in. So I understand there are all sorts of dilemmas with that. And I would certainly make a distinction, as the romantics would have done, between the good farmers and the ones... In, the, in those days, there weren't major factory farms that we have now. What I don't want to see is those major factory farms that you see in the United States and elsewhere, 
um, which are just disgraceful in terms of the way they treat animals. As it come, when it comes to animals being, you know, I defer to your better knowledge on that, being trained or accustomed to going to, to be fed. But that's the argument that they make about geese and liver and the creation of pate that people enjoy so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, yeah, but it's still a training that they go through. But yeah, so I, but I would distinguish between the good farmer and the bad farmer, just as you distinguish between any kind of good and bad practice. But I think, you know, it's very difficult to create the food that we want in this country now, um, on, uh, particularly as we're used to wanting cheap food and particularly cheap meat, to see how any way that it can be done in a very welfare-friendly fashion by most farmers, I'm afraid. Just to say, as so many p more people now become more aware of animals as sentient beings and as, as a groundswell of um, more activism for animal welfare and, and rights. Can you foresee a day where maybe more pressure is put to bear to make um, education and debate in schools, um, you know, educating children at a young age and get encouraging debate about how animals should be treated and, you know, populations of wild animals maintained? And that could go across sort of European countries as well and become sort of more compulsory. I'm not well enough versed in education policy to know how compulsory that kind of thing should be. But I remember I learned at school a lot about animals and the way they were treated. And we went on visits to places. I think we didn't have then the kind of urban farms that exist in places like Bristol and now. But um, certainly we were taught a lot about that. Um, what we weren't taught about is the whole history of that movement and about the things like the Romantics. That was something which I read at university more than anything else, and that's where my interest in this whole area started. But education is critical on all aspects, I think, and that's something which um, you know, I very much support. Uh, there has been a lot of dispute about uh, organisations, both on, um, you know, from all sides of the political spectrum on this going into schools. So I think it has to be done very carefully, um, but nonetheless, it's very important, I'd agree. Obviously, uh, it would be best if the ethical motivation for uh, the fraternity of nature comes about in that way. Uh, we might as well make use of uh, people's obsession with health. And, um, you know, if people buying their sanitised pack, four for the price of one kind of thing, um, were able to see the source of what they were buying, more in evidence, obviously. Um, of course, supermarkets would have a problem with that, but I think that's something we need to get round. Um, and um, for us to publicise, I mean, I know that Compassion in World Farming, which um, approaches it from the two angles, both... Um, to improve the condition of intensively farmed animals and also the health of the public in, you know, uh, legal necessity for, for very clear labelling of, of, you know, not in mumbo-jumbo, but really accessible. And then a lot of media push there. Mm. I mean, people are very concerned about their health mm. now. So it doesn't matter how one goes about it, so long as the message comes across. One of the things that... That's what, partly what the Nature and Wellbeing Act is, is trying to do, that it's trying to instil within, um, certainly in a wider nature perspective, the importance of nature to wellbeing and health in its way. I mean, Compassion in World Farming is a very admirable organisation, and um, you know, they do very good work in terms of uh, the two areas that you've said, and I think is one that is a model for others to follow. How do you um, compare your attitude to the, let's say, the natural food chain in which carnivores are actually tearing herbivores apart and eating them? Darwin said this when, you know, that in his tangle bank that this is what happens and that's part of the natural world. I think the difference between that and us is that we have the ability to make decisions, to do things differently and to do things better. That's the simple answer. Um, I also try to avoid palm oil um, and also 
try to eat vegan, but I'm unsuccessful with both of those, and both of those endeavours mostly. But um, particularly with palm, I was in Indonesia for a while studying orangutan poo and saw, you know, the massive, massive destruction of forests there, but also the fact that for a lot of mostly young guys there, um, palm oil plantations are one of the biggest and most terrible employers. I mean, no one's getting, no local people are getting rich off of palm oil. Um, but it just strikes me that it seems quite easy from, you know, in, de in a developed country where we've already ripped out our own forests and now using them for productive purposes. It seems really easy to say, don't do that, Indonesia. Um, you know, keep your forests for the orangutans. And that's what I'm saying. But I feel really conflicted about that. And I'd just like to hear any of your views well, I, on that. I agree. I think it is, you know, we, 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 we can't really teach the world anything on these things because we behave so badly ourselves. But just because I think we did it wrong and incorrectly and badly, that's not reason that others should do it. But we do need a way of finding ways of helping them, really. I think palm oil is a particularly... I mean, I got... I, you know, I never thought a few years ago I'd get interested in palm oil, but now I religiously observe every piece of food that I see in a supermarket, and virtually everything has got palm oil in, you know. So, and if it's not got palm oil in, it's got vegetable oil, which masks itself as, is often a, you know, palm oil in disguise. And I, you know, it is difficult to avoid it. I don't deny that. And it is also the case that, yes, they are, um, you know, that they're, um, they are creating work, however badly that work is for for other places, but enormous wealth is being made out of that, but not by, as you say, by that population. There is the Sustainable Palm Oil Trust, but even that seems rather, it's not delivering what it should be delivering from what I can see. And I think that, you know, the hypocrisy is, is throughout time. As I said, the Romantics wrote poems about cruelty using the quills of feathers pulled, pulled from live geese. And, um, and that's something, you know, we're just as hypocritical in a way. In a way, I think we should just try and do our best but I take your point about that, you know, it's difficult for us to insist others do this as, as, as we have behaved so badly ourselves. And I think that that's part of a much bigger political and economic settlement, which is beyond us at the moment, really. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.